Every visionary has a story to tell. These stories educate and inspire us all. You could hear them cranking up in the morning and hear the click, click, click of the roller coaster. It's really feeling satisfied and feeling gratified with bringing happiness to young children, especially families. Working with people who are having a good time is so much better than any other job. Join us as we learn from these trailblazers. I was uh, uh, about to be the editor of the Daily Bruin at UCLA. I just finished my junior year, and I got a call at my fraternity where I was living from a card walker uh, from Disney. Uh, only he didn't leave his name Disney, just just Card Walker. And I, I thought my fraternity brothers were playing a trick on me, so I didn't even return his call. Fortunately, uh, Mr. Walker did call back and he asked me to come in for an interview. And Walt was looking for someone to put out a tabloid newspaper on Main Street when Disneyland opened. And I went in for an interview and they hired me to do this job. And uh, I started a month before Disneyland opened. I started in June 1955. And two weeks after I went to work, I had to present this concept to Walt Disney and the Walt Disney <laughs> and I was 21 years old and had never worked professionally and I was scared as hell <laughs> and fortunately as I've told people many times uh, Walt liked it and that's why my career lasted another 54 years at Disney you know there the stories are true that there was a plumber strike just before Disneyland uh, uh, was about to open and it was settled just be, like two days before and Walt had a choice of, of uh, uh, getting the plumbing for the bathroom done or for the fountains and he picked the bathrooms of course and people said well he's forcing us to buy Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola you know the fountains don't work and uh, then there were all the places uh, where the asphalt was it was hot it was a hundred degrees and uh, women's he in those days if you can believe it women wore heels to go to places like Disneyland and uh, their heels got stuck in the asphalt Walt was very focused on fixing the things that didn't work uh, and making sure that all the attractions that were there and there were what only 17 I think when mm -hmm. Disneyland originally opened that uh, they all worked properly and the, and that the stories were uh, clear and and the and the operators knew what they were doing you know mm -hmm. this was all brand new you could tell right from the beginning that Disneyland had struck a chord with people I mean when you come in and you come into the town square and all of a sudden you left the freeway and the parking lot and everything outside and the, this berm is shutting out the, the world outside. And you stop and you say, wow, I'm in a different place. Walt did so much of that on television. My goodness, you know, he, he always had uh, something about the new attractions at Disneyland. And, and uh, so that, of course, was the biggest communication we could do. But uh, we spent a lot of time with journalists. And at the same time, the, uh, the park was developing uh, attractions and ways of, of attracting the public that had not existed before. For example, New Year's Eve. Now, no amusement park had ever done a New Year's Eve. Uh, program before and who was going to come out suppose it turned out to be 30 degrees you know and you're outside well I'll tell you a few about five or six years ago I was in Paris and it was 30 degrees at New Year's Eve and there were 60,000 people in the park and, but 
New Year's Eve party, brand new idea. And, you know, convincing the, uh, the finance people that that was a good idea was really a trick in those days. But, uh, and then grad night, you know, no one had ever done uh, grad night on the scale that, that uh, Disney was doing it. And making up all the rules where uh, the, the boys at that time had all wear coats and ties and nobody could come by car. And, uh, you know, because uh, that was part of the problem with kids in high school uh, in Southern California, there were a couple of accidents that killed young people, and they were looking for things to do on grad night. But these were all in the, back in the 50s, and they were brand new ideas. So uh, on the one hand, Walt was developing new attractions, the submarine voyage, the Matterhorn, all of those things. And on the other hand, from a marketing standpoint, we were creating uh, ways to to new ways of convincing the public that they could have a good time in Disneyland. He trusted the talent. They knew how to work with, mm -hmm. with Walt and, and, uh, and they loved it. They, and they loved the challenges that he kept throwing uh, at them. And uh, I remember a meeting that we had with uh, Yale Gracie, who developed all the, all the uh, tricks for the Haunted Mansion and, and the fire effect in the, in the, uh, uh, in the Pirates and, and all of that, and T. He, who was a great character artist. And they were working on a, on a uh, space shooting gallery. And it was wild, you know, and just the wildest ideas that I think any of us had ever seen, electronic shooting gallery. And Walt came in for the review and didn't say a word, nothing, absolutely nothing for an hour as they went through all these things. And finally, he turned to go and he turned back to Yale and Teehee and he says, is that all they do? And left. And you know, everybody knew exactly what he meant. He said, keep going, go even further, mm -hmm. make it really wild. And it was that kind of direction that we, we always got. And, and you could always tell what, what the temperature was, if I could put it that way. Even though, and I heard Dick Sherman, if I can uh, reference that, you never got it directly from him. You always got it from somebody else. Walt liked your idea, you know. You know, for a little organization, as I said, when we started, we had 100 people to do four major pavilions for the fair. That was an enormous challenge. And, and particularly, you know, uh, Robert Moses, uh, the, uh, the major domo of the New York World's Fair had come out and Walt had the whole presentation for the Hall of Presidents. I mean, it was, uh, it was an hour long show at the time. Moses fell in love with it and he wanted the Hall of Presidents. And Walt said, we haven't even done one figure. How am I gonna give you, at that time, 30 some? And uh, so Moses kept after him and, and got the state of Illinois involved. And for the first time, uh, we had to do a, a, a human audio animatronic figure. Now we hadn't even done a bird at that time because the Tiki Room opened in 1963 and the fair opened in 64. So, you know, this could have killed audio animatronics mm -hmm. very easily. And yet, not only did Walt bet on, you know, he made great bets on all of the, the talent that was doing this because it was not only Lincoln, it was all the characters in the Carousel of Progress and, uh, and the dinosaurs and the cavemen and in the Ford Pavilion, an enormous amount of, of uh, animated figures, three-dimensional. And, uh, and then, we're, when we're all just up to our ears and trying to get this done, someone comes in and says, oh, would you like to do a show for us about the children of the world? And this is 11 months before the fair opened, and nothing, zero. And that was, that was the most exciting thing, I think, I, I, still today. 
that, I, that we all ever worked on because there was only one way to do it. Simple, simple, simple. Everything, you know, every one of those characters, the, the, nothing sophisticated in that whole show. Nothing, because how could you get it done? You had to get off the shelf motors for the, for the figures and, but it was exciting. And, and every day there'd be something new, like Walt would bring Bob and Dick Sherman over and play the song, you know. Uh, and Mary Blair working with someone who had such a, a, a way to finesse color. I mean, Mary, I think, I think she had an astigmatism and never saw color like you and I do. I mean, she was brilliant at that. And um, it was exciting to, to work on something like that. It was a watershed because here's what Walt was doing. He's, he basically said, look, I want to grow Disneyland. So he, he actually set in the contracts with GE and Ford that uh, there was a name use fee for his name. And th if they came into Disneyland, that was forgiven. It was their down payment. And GE decided to do it, Ford didn't. Even though we made a big pitch to Ford, Bob and Dick wrote a song called get the feel of the wheel of a Ford. Uh, and uh, we did a big presentation to Henry Ford and they, they decided not to, but that was one, grow Disneyland. Two, uh, prove that that kind of entertainment would work in the, on the East Coast. Stepping stone to Walt Disney World. Those were the goals really, and they worked. Walt asked uh, Buzz actually to do two studies. The first one was, should I go to New York or should I go to Florida? And uh, Buzz uh, described how he came up with that. He had over a weekend and he wrote 40 pages of why you don't want to go to New York and you want to go to Florida. That was number one. Then in 1963, he got the assignment to say where in Florida. And he determined that uh, Central Florida, everybody, even going to Miami, had to pass through Central Florida. So that was the key place uh, where traffic was going to go from, from the coast, from going uh, north and south. Everybody went through Central Florida. And so he pinpointed that area, not a specific piece of property. Today, when you go to Orlando, you can buy anything, you know, and build a project. But 1967, 1968, there was nothing there. And Disney was cutting through so much that was happening. You know, when we first started sending our people down there, there were, you'd, you'd go into places uh, 10 miles from Orlando and it, and it would say colored entrance and, and white entrance. And that was Central Florida at that time. And we were cutting through all that. And, you know, I think one of the things that Disney did, among others, was integrate so much of, of uh, Central Florida with its employment practices. But it, it was a, uh, there was nothing there. I have a picture that I prize greatly. It was uh, October 1967. And it was, uh, standing in the clearing that we'd done for the Magic Kingdom, 100 acres, and we put a big yellow X where we were going to build the castle, October 1967. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what I feel like when I go down there now and there's 300,000 people on that property. It was all starting, from, if you talk about scratch land, man, it was scratch. And uh, we, were, we tried so many different things. I mean, Bill Evans, um, would, uh, who was in charge of landscaping, he was one of the first Disney employees that were sent down there. And he, would, uh, he brought in things from all over the world to see if they would grow in that climate. And we learned a lot uh, from that that paid off later in the other parks, and especially the Animal Kingdom when mm -hmm. we got to that. But uh, it was... It was pioneer stuff. 
when we were building Walt Disney World, the uh, RCA had the contract for the communications infrastructure. That was the telephones and the, all the, 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 the computer systems, and they were in the computer business at that time, by the way. Uh, and it was a huge contract for the whole infrastructure. And uh, there was a quid pro quo in the contract, and that was there was $10 million set aside if we could figure out how to create an attraction that RCA would sponsor in the park. Well, John Hench and I worked for, for literally for nine months with RCA, and what we were going to do, they were in the computer business, so uh, we were going to take people inside the computer and tell the story from the inside. We worked uh, through every level of RCA, all the way up through the, the top management, and they all loved it. And they said, well, now you have to present it to Mr. Sarnoff, the chairman. So uh, we went back to New York. We had nine storyboards, and uh, they put us in their, uh, their wonderful conference room overlooking Central Park in the old RCA building. And we had these, con uh, these storyboards stretched out the whole length of the room. And we got finished setting it up, and the RCA people said, now you know Mr. Sarno sits at the head of the table. And I said, wait a minute, down there, it was as long as this room, down there I've got a, a sketch that's this size. How's he even gonna see that? And they said, well, that's your problem. Mr. Sarnoff always sits at the head of the table. So the next morning, I made the presentation. And I, I've done dozens and dozens of presentations to industry and companies and our own corporation. This was a disaster. <laughs> Here's this man sitting back down here, and I'm down there trying to explain. It was terrible. So naturally, we didn't make the sale. So I went back to Imagineering in Glendale, and I went to John Hench, and by that time, I decided here was the approach I was going to take. And I said, John, we screwed up. He said, what do you mean? We had a great idea. They all loved it. And I said, John, what we did was what they wanted us to do. Why don't we figure out what we need for the park and then con them into sponsoring it? I may not have used the word con, but not with RCA anyway. So John had done the concept for Space Mountain in 1965 or 66. And you couldn't do it at the time because communication systems, computer systems, weren't sophisticated enough to keep those cars separate inside that mountain. Now it's 1971 and you could do it. And so we said, okay, let's take Space Mountain and we'll blow it up. The one in Florida is a, a third bigger, 300 feet in diameter. There are others in Disneyland and Tokyo are 200 feet in diameter. We put a long corridor going in, and RCA was in the communications satellite business. So you had all these windows where you could look out and see their satellites doing things out in space. And then after the ride, we created what we called the home of future living with all, all the RCA products, put a moving ramp. Okay, so now we have this idea, and we take it back again. We set up the meeting. They put. We had another nine storyboards for all this stuff. And when uh, we were through setting up the night before, they said, now Mr. Sarnoff, remember, he sits at the head of the table. And I said, well, if he's there, I'm going to have my back to him the whole presentation because I'm going to talk to whoever's here. And I picked out this, the prime seat in the middle. And they said, you can't do that. And I said, you know, I don't work for you. I am going to do it. Next morning, they stationed somebody by that seat. And when Mr. Sarnoff came in, they said, Mr. Sarnoff, the Disney people would like you to sit here. He said, fine, and sat down immediately. You know, no one had ever asked before. And so we made the presentation. And this time, not only did we get him in the right place, but I insisted that Mr. Walker and our vice chairman, Mr. Tatum, both of whom knew Mr. Sarnoff, come, come to the meeting. And we sold the project, got the $10 million, and that's why there's a Space Mountain. 
you know, I, I still have fresh in my mind, I have six or seven pages of notes that I took from my meetings with Walt Disney. And so many times he said, we're going to meet the needs of people, meet the needs of people. He was so focused on that. And it derived from a lot of things, his own experiences. I remember one time he told this story that uh, uh, Diane and one of his daughters, Diane Miller and Ron Miller, that uh, they had gone on a trip and so Mrs. Disney and Walt were babysitting. And uh, in the back of the Miller's home there was an alley and the trash trucks came by at six o'clock in the morning and they knocked over all the trash cans and it woke everybody up. And Walt said, there must be a better way to collect trash. And we ended up finding the AVAC pneumatic trash disposal system that we installed at Walt Disney World, you know. So this was the way the man's mind worked and he thought that he could demonstrate and test new equipment, new, you know, and everywhere Walt Disney went to the great laboratories of companies, IBM and, and uh, the DuPont labs and the Sarnoff labs at RCA and the GE labs, they trot out the very latest things they were working on to show him and he'd say well when can I buy a product with that technology and they'd say well we don't know if the public's interested and so he kept seeing these things as uh, ways that he could become part of communicating those things to the public. We had this film that expressed uh, exactly what Walt wanted to accomplish and it was a community and yet Disney had to step back and say, how do we get started in Florida? And it had to be something that the company knew, and that was the park business. You create a magnet for people to come. That was the Magic Kingdom, and places for them to stay. Once that was established, as you say, then we could start thinking about what do we do with this big idea? Well, we didn't really know how to get started with this so what we did was we we held a series of meetings starting in 1975 on energy and food and health and transportation and etc and we invited people from academia and from companies and uh, consultants that we had read about doing great things in the world and we brought them together in, in Florida and we said okay we're Here's this concept. Now, uh, how do we communicate that to the public? We're showmen, we're storytellers, and in the entertainment business, we don't know what should be communicated. And it was really interesting because you, uh, when the meetings ended, there were usually two or three days, and, and the reports were done to us at the end, they would say, now, the public really doesn't trust government and what they're telling them. They really don't trust what industry's telling them. But they trust Mickey Mouse. And so you people have a role in this. Well, we had to figure out how to express that role. And uh, you know, that's where the pavilions in Epcot originated. And we found some of the great people in the, in the world to work with us. Bob Ballard, who found the, the Titanic I uh, was on our Living Seas Advisory Board and uh, we found Carl Hodges from the University of Arizona and uh, head of the Environmental Research Lab that figured out all the food growing systems in the land pavilion. There were people in the company that uh, said we want to talk about the parks as being escapism and I had, I, I had a fit because I had learned from John. John said, the parks are not about escapism, they're about reassurance. They're, they reassure you that the world can be okay, that you can talk to a stranger in a public place, that a public place can be clean, and, and that the employees, the cast members, can be friendly. And they, they reassure you, and, uh, and I think he's so, he was so correct about that. Herb Ryman, uh, gosh, you look at Herbie's drawings and you understood why Walt always picked, you know, always had Herbie draw, draw the first drawing of anything. That, that original drawing of Disneyland done over a weekend, it, if you look at it, you, 
how can how could somebody do that I mean, in pencil, you know, and, and with Walt standing at his shoulder, and so many things. If you look closely at it, uh, were never built, and other things weren't built till year five, year six. It was all in that man's head, Walt Disney's head. Uh, but Herbie could express it. If you put Claude Coates and Mark Davis together, it was oil and water. They're so different personalities, their interests were totally different. And yet Claude was the best who ever was in our business in doing backgrounds for attractions. He had come out of backgrounds in animation. Peter Pan and was the last one he worked on at the studio. But he could lay out a ride, no one ever did it better. And Mark did all the business, all the, the, the jokes and all the, the character development. And those two things went together. Uh, and, and they fit like this beautifully. And you know, when you think about Walt Disney as a casting director, when you talk to Ex Atencio, just ask him how many scripts he had written before Walt said, I want you to write the script for the Pirates. The answer is zero. And how that man knew that X could do that, you know, is pretty amazing. John DeCure, uh, who came in and worked on the Hall of Presidents with us, here's a man who was nominated as an art director for 11 Academy Awards, one for Hello Dolly and Cleopatra, and one other three, won three Academy Awards, and he did the Hall of Presidents uh, art direction with us, and Harper Goff, who laid out the, the original Jungle Cruise, and Harper was really responsible for the layout of the World Showcase in Epcot. And we had a different uh, uh, approach, and Harper one day just did a drawing that brought it all together. And uh, how could you put, you know, the design for Germany next to the design for Japan, or you know, those kind of things? Uh, and he figured it it out. And Harriet Burns, she was so special and, and you know and Walt loved her and you look at some of those early uh, uh, television lead-ins of, of uh, for Disneyland shows there's Harriet all the time because she she was the one pretty <laughs> that you could find in our model shop